Thank you, everyone, for being here. Welcome. It's a, really a pleasure to, uh, to see you for the first time. I hope we'll have many more opportunities to, uh, to interact. So um, I thought I was going to tell you a little bit about my broad area of research, which might be unfamiliar um, to some of you. It's causal inference and experimental design. Um, and then I'm going to try to give you a flavor for the kind of problems that I've been thinking about the last few years and uh, that I would like to keep thinking about um, going in the future. So um, what is causal inference? I think the best way to uh, illustrate this is with an example, uh, an actual real life example, um, that was the um, HRT debate, the hormone replacement therapy debate. Um, so HRT is uh, a um, estrogen-based drug or treatment um, that is supposed to alleviate some of the symptoms uh, in menopausal women. And, um, it was first, the first drug uh, that has this flavor was introduced in uh, the mid 1940s. It was called Primarin. Um, and for the next 30 years, it enjoyed a certain success and uh, it was uh, shown to be um, helpful. And um, so the state of the debate in the, the 80s and 90s was um, that a lot, a lot of observational studies showed that. Um, uh, HRT was actually good for coronary heart disease, was reducing the rate of heart diseases. Um, and so there was this, um, this paper that kind of summarizes the, the whole thing is, well, there is extensive observational evidence that estrogen use reduces risk for coronary heart disease by 35%. Um, now, those of you who've worked in like either biological science or anything, 35% is a lot, is very, very large. Um, so that's, that was in the published papers. And so um, what do they mean by observational evidence? Um, well, you know, you just go around and you find some women who are taking uh, hormone replacement therapy and you find some women who are not taking hormone replacement therapy um, and then you're comparing them. Um, that's, that's what you're doing. Okay. Um, but here's the thing. Um, it's true that here we compare uh, treated women with um, non-treated women, but... Is it clear that we can attribute the, um, any difference in coronary heart disease solely to the treatment? Um, well, in the 90s, people started thinking about uh, something called the um, healthy women effect. Um, and um, this was summarized by Barrett Conner in 1996, where she said, well, overall, so she just looked at the background characteristics of the women who actually took the hormone replacement therapy, and she said, overall, women who take estrogens after the menopause are more likely to be Caucasian, educated, upper middle class, and lean, and therefore at lower risk for heart disease. Well, <laughs> okay, so what's happening? Um, so... This is, you know, the, uh, our, our, the, the women, some, some who take HRT and some who don't. What happens is that really you have um, health-conscious and physically active women who take the treatment, and you have less healthy uh, and more sedentary women uh, who don't take the treatment. So this is the comparison that you're doing, and sure, you know, some of them have the treatment and some of them don't have the treatment, but they also differ in, like, other ways, major ways uh, that can ex explain what's going on. Um, so, um, how do we, how do we actually fix that? Or like, how do we actually get a, a serious answer to the question that we're asking? Um, well, we run a randomized experiment. Um, and this is exactly what, uh, what was done. NIH founded, funded the Women Health Initiative, um, uh, which basically is a really, really, really large randomized experiment. They took a sample of 16,000 women, age 50 to roughly 80 years old, um, and um, they looked at uh, two things. The primary outcome was the coronary heart disease. That's the question that we were asking. And um, the second was uh, invasive breast cancer. Um, so they looked at these two things. So what's the, the general um, idea of a randomized experiment? You first gather some women. Um, so maybe some of them are health conscious and some of them aren't. Um, and then you randomize. Uh, so you assign randomly some of them to receive the intervention and some of them to not receive the intervention. Um, and then you compare. And now you see this looks very different from what we had before. This time, the two groups are roughly comparable on everything that's not the, the treatment. So they did this. Um, and in May 31st, 2002, the experiment was stopped early on the recommendation of the safety board because the data indicated that the risks exceeded potential benefits. Um, 
what they found is actually an increased risk of breast cancer and absolutely no effect on coronary heart disease. Um, now, th uh, the stakes are not always that high. That's kind of a, a sad story, and it's kind of s still ongoing. So people realize that, well, um, this experiment was run on like certain types of women. It's possible that uh, the HRT benefits other women. So I'm not here speaking of, uh, uh, about the relative merits of, of coronary heart disease. What I'm, uh, of <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm definitely not going to talk about the relative benefits of that. Um, <laughs> Of, of HRT, but the general idea is that if you want to make a, a, a serious claim, the best source of evidence that you have is a randomized experiment. You can't always do it. There are some times where you, you just can't. It's not ethical um, or, or it's just in, impractical, but that's still our best source of evidence. Now, um, what I've been interesting, interested in the last few years is a, a, a particular complication that happens in, in randomized experiment, and this is when units interfere with each other. Um, so Nick mentioned like kind of like network systems. Um, this is the kind of problems that I'm that I'm interested in. So um, let me give you an example. So this is an experiment that was run by one of my collaborators um, in the school district of Philadelphia. So what he did was, so the, the general background, so 10% of the K-12 K um, students are chronically absent, meaning that they miss more than uh, 18 days of school a year. Um, and this is a problem. It's been shown that it's, uh, absenteeism is associated with a, a host of, of uh, fairly undesirable outcomes um, for children. Um, and so they were interested in an, uh, uh, testing an intervention to reduce absence rate. So what they did is they sent um, mail to parents of absentee children. Um, randomly, uh, if, 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 if there were multiple children in the household, they would just randomly pick which children was mentioned in the mail and then tell them that their kids was skipping schools. And um, they, they were, the idea is that this light touch intervention was supposed to reduce uh, the absence rate. Um, and they looked at the number of days of absence following that. And the question is, well, does the intervention reduce the absence rate? So um, imagine that these are, say, households, and they randomly assign some, some uh, kids to be targeted by the male and some to not be targeted by the male. Um, and then they compared um, the two. And that's a natural thing. It's basically what we, what we saw previously on the randomized experiment. Um, but here's the problem. Um, if you have two children in the same household, if you send a mail to a parent telling them that one of their uh, child is, is skipping school, they'll probably be more careful also for the other child. Um, and so um, these, these pale blue units are not really untreated. They are like meh treated. <laughs> uh, meh. Um, and so here's what you're doing. You're really comparing treated units to a bag of, well, some untreated units and some treated, and some that are like a, a little bit treated. Um, and so basically, uh, if you believe that your intervention has an effect, doing that comparison is basically underestimating the effect in question. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to bore you about, uh, with the details of, of how to fix this, but the, the, the broad idea is that, well, what you really want is to compare two different things. You want to compare uh, the treated units with the pure red units. And you want to compare, this is what we would call the primary effect. And then you would compare uh, the pale blue units to the red units. And that's the spillover effect. Um, and we actually did something along those lines. And what we found is that, well, the, there's actually the spillover effect is uh, about half of the primary effect in magnitude. So really, if you don't account for that, you're really, really, really underestimating um, the effect of your intervention. Um, all right. So. Um, that's a f still a somewhat simple case uh, because the, we basically assume that the, um, basically households don't interact with each other. So uh, if you send an email about, uh, to a parent about their child, this is not going to affect the children of, in other families. Um, so it, it's still well contained. Um, here's a slightly more challenging problem uh, that I'm currently working on. Um, so this is an experiment that was run uh, in Medellin in Colombia. And um, the purpose of the experiment was to see whether it was possible to reduce the crime rate uh, by increasing the police presence in some streets. So the exact design was they looked at uh, so-called hotspot streets in, in, in Medellin, 
and they randomly assign some of them to receive more police presence and some of them to receive less, oh, to, sorry, to have the same amount of police presence. They did not reduce uh, policing in Medellin. No, they did not. Um, so here, the unit of analysis is a street segment, and um, what, what they looked at was the, um, a number of different outcomes, including a uh, number of violent crimes. Um, and they had two questions. One is, what's the effect of policing on the actual street in which it happened? That makes sense. Um, but the second is, um, what's the effect of uh, policing in the neighborhood? So for instance, if I increase the police presence in this street, what is that going to do to the streets around? And you have two hypotheses. Um, one is, well, if I increase the police presence in the street, this is going to have a kind of local pacifying effect. So the neighboring streets are also going to be safer. And then you have the other hypothesis, which is, well, if someone can't deal drugs in the street, he's just going to do his business in the neighboring street. Just, that seems like an obvious, an obvious thing. Um, and that's, you can imagine that those have very, very different policy implications. Um, in the one case, uh, you can imagine uh, targeting uh, policing in some streets, and that, gets, that basically pacifies the whole city. Uh, the other is basically a, a, a whack-a-mole game where you just like put more police presence and people just pop up somewhere else. Um, you don't want that. Um, so this is something that we're, it's, it's still very much ongoing. We don't have definitive conclusions at the moment, but how to address that kind of problem and how to design that kind of experiment is something that um, is, is, I'm going to keep working on in, in the future. Thank you for your attention.